All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of Kel. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. In today's episode, I will be discussing the connections between our modern chemical manufacturing processes and my proposed theory on the function of the Egyptian pyramids, which is that these structures were producing a series of chemicals, starting with methane, ammonia, urea, sulfuric and hydrochloric acids, and culminating with the production of ferrous sulfate in ancient Ireland. This is a topic that I've covered in depth during individual episodes, but this comprehensive overview has been one of the most highly requested topics in the comment section. I can tell you in advance, this is going to be one hell of a ride. I really hope you all are enjoying the new weekly site visits here on the land of Kem and the new Living in Egypt series. And if you're into the function of the Egyptian pyramids, this is the channel for you. So if you haven't already, please subscribe, click that little notification button because you do not want to miss the content that I have coming up in the next several weeks. If you want to help support the channel, just go to thelandofchem.com. You can pick up a limited first edition print copy of the book, grab yourself some merch. Either way, all the orders mean the world to me. Thank you all so much for the support. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at thelandofchem. Ladies and gentlemen, I will close today's intro with a quote from Ecclesiastes 1.9. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get right to it. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. So my theory about the function of the Egyptian pyramids begins with the production of methane gas at the Steppe Pyramid in Saqqara, a very simple process that is a prime example of ancient chemistry. No lost ancient high technology, but extremely in-depth knowledge of physics and chemistry. And we are still using this exact same process today which you can see here in this diagram of a methane biogas digester. This process involves introducing a slurry containing water, agricultural scrap material, and cattle manure into a digestion chamber through an inlet shaft that you can see here on the left. The anaerobic bacteria in the cattle manure initiate the digestion process that breaks down the carbon-based plant material, transforming it into methane gas which rises out of the slurry and is collected in a chamber above the digester. The gas is then extracted through an outlet here and the digested material is removed through the outlet shaft here and can be reused as fertilizer. And this is the exact same configuration that we find within the original design of the Step Pyramid, which in its inception wasn't a pyramid at all, but rather a single level platform that you can see here in yellow that featured an inlet shaft leading in from the north here, a large rectangular central chamber here, and an outlet shaft to the south here. There were, of course, later modifications to the structure that I have explained before. And if you're new to the channel, I highly recommend checking out the playlist called Start From The Beginning so you can get brought up to speed on all the details. And I will put a link to that series in the video description below. And you can see here on the right that our modern biogas digesters mimic the same design of the step pyramid. And I certainly wouldn't call this process industrial scale chemical manufacturing, but I do believe that the ancient pre-dynastic Egyptians that built the pyramids were producing large volumes of methane gas at the step pyramid for domestic and industrial use within the cities. But this system could, and still is today, be implemented in rural agricultural areas to provide heating, lighting, boiling water, etc. as you can see here in this depiction of a small farm that is using the exact same process to eliminate the biological waste from cattle and humans and transforming it into an extremely useful chemical. This is why cattle were so important to this ancient civilization, which inevitably led to their deification, as I have described in many previous episodes. And then, the methane that was being produced within the Steppe Pyramid was transported via underground shaft system to the Red Pyramid of Dashur and converted into ammonia gas and an aqueous ammonia solution. The process that I have proposed for the operation of the Red Pyramid bears a remarkable similarity 
to our modern industrial process for making ammonia, which is called the Haber process. And you can see here on the left, the first apparatus that was designed by Haber to produce ammonia, which has a startling resemblance to the configuration of the reaction chambers inside the Red Pyramid. And they operated on the same simple Physics 101 based principles. So the Haber process involves reacting methane and steam from water in the primary steam reformer, which is the first reactor that you can see here on the left. This creates carbon dioxide and hydrogen that are then transferred into the secondary air reformer, where the oxygen and nitrogen from the air are introduced into the system, which you can see here. Within the secondary reformer, the methane is broken down to create more carbon dioxide and liberated hydrogen. And these three gases are then reacted under high temperature and pressure to produce carbon dioxide, as you can see here in this diagram. Water is constantly being utilized within this system, especially within the third stage, as the water dissolves the carbon dioxide byproduct and removes it from the system, which you can see here. All of this should be sounding very familiar, as these are the same mechanisms of operation that were occurring inside of the Red Pyramid. Certainly not at the same extreme temperature and pressures that we are using today, but when I finally reveal the most critical details of this structure's operation, which I have not yet discussed on this channel or even within the first book, you will finally understand how these difficult reactions were facilitated in the ancient world. They did not use electricity, but something even more fascinating. So if you haven't already, please subscribe and stay tuned because once my second book drops, things will exponentially escalate here on the channel. Next up, once that carbon dioxide byproduct is dissolved into water and removed from the system, just as in the final stage of reaction inside the secondary chamber of the Red Pyramid, the nitrogen and hydrogen are introduced into the final reaction chamber, which you can see here. And once again, they are reacted under high temperature and pressure to produce ammonia gas. And just look what we have here, iron catalyst material, which in most applications is actually described as iron oxide catalyst Fe2O3 with a combination of potassium oxide and aluminum oxide. Hmm, iron oxide you say? Isn't that the exact same material that we have been discussing was the main component of the staining inside of these chambers along with some other metal and non-metal oxides. The evidence for my theory is becoming more and more abundant, and everything that I've been proposing continues to be corroborated by these chemical analyses and other data. This is not some lost ancient high technology bullshit that has zero scientific value, but the most solid and verifiable theory that has ever been proposed for the function of every single major pyramid in Egypt. And we are still using this same methodology and materials in today's modern industrial scale chemical manufacturing. Now, one major difference between the ancient chemical engineering and today's Haber process is the cooling step, where today they super cool the ammonia gas to produce liquid ammonia, as you can see here at the bottom. An extremely difficult step that requires very low temperature, as opposed to my theory, where they simply dissolved the ammonia gas into water to create an aqueous ammonia solution. These are two very different products and an important distinction to make. But regardless, the product still contains ammonia and would have the exact same applications. And I don't know if you can see it, but to me, this whole system bears a remarkable similarity to the third chamber of the Red Pyramid, with the connecting shaft here, the vaulted reaction chamber here, and the pit at the bottom here. And this is a synopsis of that entire reaction, transforming methane into ammonia. And then what do we do with it today? We build another reactor near the ammonia plant to convert that ammonia into urea, which is the primary function that I have proposed for the bent pyramid. And that reaction is very simple, where the carbon dioxide byproduct can be reacted with the ammonia to produce ammonium bicarbonate, or under different temperature and pressure conditions can create ammonium carbamate, which is then dehydrated to yield urea, an extremely stable, high nitrogen content compound that is used for fertilizer. Now, there is something else that can be done with the ammonia solution from the Red Pyramid, which is 
converting it into nitric acid, a critical acid that is utilized to create the coveted aqua regia by combining it with hydrochloric acid. So if you've been following this channel, you should already know that I have proposed that hydrochloric acid was being produced inside of the central pyramid of Giza. But where was this nitric acid solution being created? That will be coming up soon, so please subscribe and stay tuned. All right, everyone, just a quick reminder that if you want to support the channel, I need your help now more than ever as I am living in Egypt full time so I can bring you a ton of new content every single week. So just check out thelandofchem.com. I have some awesome new merch. This black on black is absolutely fire. Of course, there's hoodies, long sleeve shirts, regular t-shirts in both logos in a ton of different colors. And don't forget the genesis of the entire Land of Chem YouTube channel, my book. The Land of Chem, an initiation into ancient chemistry through the degrees of the Egyptian pyramids. So if you want to help support, just go to thelandofchem.com. You can grab some merch, grab a copy of the book. Either way, all the orders mean the world to me. So thank you all so much. All right, moving on to the Giza Plateau and our modern day contact process. The industrial scale reaction that we are currently using to produce sulfuric acid. And you can see here that sulfur and air are introduced into a furnace chamber to produce sulfur dioxide, then pulled through the catalytic converter here to create sulfur trioxide, and then dissolved into water here in the absorption tower. And I've explained in previous episodes how the Great Pyramid is configured to do the same thing with your furnace chamber here, a catalyst chamber of sorts here, the absorption tower here, and your extraction chamber here. Now, another major difference to point out is that in our modern process, there is an intermediate step involving oleum and concentrated sulfuric acid, which I do not think was involved in the ancient chemical engineering. It was much simpler by just dissolving the sulfur trioxide directly into water to create a very dilute solution of sulfuric acid, which is then immediately extracted from the chambers. And yes, these chambers would have been sealed with a non-reactive coating compound to prevent corrosion of the limestone. And we have already seen prolific evidence of these type of compounds with the coating paint on the red pyramid, which is a mixture of silicon and sulfur trioxide in its solid form, literally proving that this ancient civilization not only knew about and was producing sulfur trioxide, but turning it from a gas into a solid to then create a variety of other products. Really stacking up the evidence for my theory that this was a civilization based in industrial scale chemical engineering to create all of the products that were needed exactly the same way that we do today. Our modern society would not exist without industrial scale chemistry. And these structures were the inspiration for our modern processes. Next up, hydrochloric acid on the laboratory scale, which you can see here is very simple. You put sodium chloride into a beaker, introduce sulfuric acid and heat. This creates hydrogen chloride gas that is then dissolved into water to produce hydrochloric acid. And we don't use this methodology to make the product on an industrial scale today. But as you have seen thus far, this ancient chemistry was much simpler and the products were more dilute and most likely much smaller yields created over a longer time period. Nonetheless, take the same configuration I just showed and replace those beakers with these reaction chambers, where your salt is introduced into the primary chamber here, reacted with sulfuric acid, the hydrogen chloride gas then flows through this shaft system down here, where it is dissolved into water and extracted within the lower chamber system. And I've already gone into much greater detail on exactly how this happened, not only in the book, but in previous episodes here on the channel. So go grab a copy of the book to show some love and read all the details, and then come back to watch these videos, which is the entire intention of this channel, to provide supplementary material, videos, diagrams, etc., that go along with the story in the book. And now, on to my current favorite part of the entire story, the extremely ancient heap leaching chemistry of the mysterious Irish Tuatadonan, as just explained in episodes 67 and 76. And those two episodes are absolute bangers. So definitely check those out. And here is an image of a modern heap leaching process where acid is poured onto a mound of ore containing the desired product. The acid 
leaches out the metals or whatever you're trying to extract. And then the leachate is collected to extract the desired compound. Very simple. And yes, I do believe that the ancient Egyptians were using the acids being produced in Giza for mining purposes. Just take a look at my recent video exploring the Giza Plateau, where it certainly looks like acids were being poured into those pits containing the iron oxide deposits. Again, the evidence just continues to build in support of my theory. And that is why I am here in Egypt in person, so I can bring you this type of research directly from the sites every single week. And as I've mentioned before, the ancient heap leaching process was a bit simpler. Introduce the reactant iron disulfide into an oxidation chamber where it was transformed into water soluble ferrous sulfate. So they didn't need acid to leach out the product, they just used water. But it just so happens that sulfuric acid is a byproduct of this reaction, and I'll be coming back to this topic later. And this heap leaching reaction is exactly what is depicted here on the curbstone of Newgrange, an ancient equation for this chemical engineering sequence, a literal instruction manual for the operation of the site sitting right out front. And I am the first person that has ever deciphered these symbols, one of the greatest moments of my entire life. And just as a side note, there have been some questions as to my opinion of the racial background of the civilization that built the Egyptian pyramids. And I have proposed that I do think the Tua de Danan built these structures here in Ireland and across Europe, as there is plenty of evidence within the Labor Gabala Aran, a book describing the ancient history of Ireland to support this conclusion. However, when it comes to Egypt and race, to me, it is completely irrelevant. Black, white, brown, regular sized people or giant sized people, it as as the rock used to say, it doesn't matter. All I care about is the chemistry. There is so much more to the story of this ancient chemical engineering that will be revealed soon. So please subscribe, grab a copy of the book and some merch to show some love and stay tuned. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 77, Nothing New Under the Sun, an examination of modern and ancient chemical manufacturing. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. And in the next episode in the series, I will be discussing ancient metallurgy and the rare exotic metals that we have started to discover all across Egypt from the recent chemical analyses. Things are really starting to heat up here on the Land of Chem YouTube channel. So if you haven't already, please subscribe, click that little notification button and stay tuned. If you want to help support the channel, you know what to do. Thelandofchem.com, grab some merch, copies of the book. Either way, all the orders mean the world to me. Thank you all so much for the support. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at the Land of Chem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's video. So I will see you next time. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now.